Okay, cool. All right. Well, I've been told I can start whenever I want. So thanks everyone for coming to my talk. And I'm going to, uh, it's called the Minuteman. All I need is 60 seconds. Right now I'm going to be talking relatively slow, but that'll pick up. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a senior security analyst at a firm called Stack and Lou. Essentially, I'm a security consultant. I do penetration testing and application security, everything from external, internal network pen tests to uh, web application pen tests, uh, code review, application security, SDLC stuff. Um, I've been in IT for seven years, and I've been in information security for just a little over four. And um, I'm a big evangelist on top of all the stuff I actually do for work. I'm a big evangelist for it in general and um, like to see people learn some things. So hopefully that's what we'll pick up from this. So what the talk is going to be about today is, uh, I know the, uh, the name is a little confusing and funny, but um, essentially what I'm going to cover is a very broad high level range of security topics and I'm going to try to give them 60 seconds each. Some are going to go under, some are going to go over. Um, Honestly, I didn't rehearse to see how long it was going to take for each one, so I'm just going to try to talk about it. But if I if I ramble on too much and I have a bad judge of time, someone just yell at me to go to the next topic. But I'm going to try to do 60 seconds, so hopefully you guys can keep up. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the industry in general, concepts within the industry, concepts within information security, hacks, like recent hacks, cool hacks, a little bit of that, and fun stuff that I threw in there um, just from the things that I've learned over the years. The main focus of this talk will not be for somebody who is like a pen tester on a day to day. I mean, if you know this stuff, all of this is going to be pretty much a review for you, but it should be still fun. So, okay to hang around. Um, and I just want to let you know that the slides are ugly because they're only 60 seconds. So I assume you guys aren't going to look at them for long enough to actually see what I've, I've written. So they're, they're not exactly the prettiest slides in the world. So, okay, we're just going to get started. So, well, let's begin right away with some buzz stuff. So, Big data, essentially analyzing all the crap that's on the internet and somehow turning it into usable data, taking every bit of information that we can find on the internet that people have put on, that companies have put into it, um, wrapping security around it. That's a new buzzword of big data that just came out that uh, I've actually just started reading about. I'm sure it's been longer than that, but I never really uh, paid attention until now. So SMB, it's a buzzword. It actually just means small and medium businesses, and we're realizing that small and medium businesses need security just as much as corporate environments do. Um, so the cloud SaaS, like what happens when it rains? So there's a little cloud there. Um, so what happens when a cloud and cloud security and SaaS security right now is actually, that's a big, very big topic because of the fact um, people are looking at it as if, oh, if I just put my data out into the cloud, it's secure because it's going somewhere that is secure. But realistically speaking, it's just going to a data center, data center somewhere. I mean, when it comes down to it. So security for the cloud is a big topic right now. There are multiple things. Uh, you know, uh, boards and conferences and companies that are just trying to cover cloud security in and of itself. Um, APT, Anonymous, and LulzSec, all of those things are just trying hard to own you. Essentially, uh, every bit of one of those, everyone is aware of Anonymous and LulzSec, the two hacktivist groups which are going out of their way to um, try to hack corporations and they tie together with APT because APT is Advanced Persistent Threat, which means that if somebody wants into your network, they will do it. They will find a way. Um, I everything, obviously, everything is going towards the way of smart devices, whether it be a television, whether it be an iPhone, whether it be a smartphone in general, whether it be a networked printer, everything is going towards being a iDevice. People are even calling things that aren't Apple products, i products, and those are going to need security just as bad as everything else that does in the world right now. So that's a new buzz. Uh, BYOD, bring your own device, is becoming a trending topic, and I think of more of it as bring your own virus because we can't trust people with the things they do. That's a good one too, bring your own disaster. So essentially, what that means is uh, people are letting people, uh, people are letting their employees come into a corporate env environment, bringing their own computers, their own hardware, and just assuming that everything will be okay. Although there's a lot of risk involved with that, as you can imagine, people don't know how to use their computers. I'm sure. Many of you in the room have gotten calls about, hey, can you help me pull the virus off my computer that I put on it? So they're bringing that sort of uh, problem into the corporations now by having implementing BYOD. So buzz compliance. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I don't even know. I, this has probably been a while since I've even looked at it. Um, uh, compliance is also buzz, although it's been around for a very long time. It seems like compliance is coming up further and further into security 
from a sense that every single thing is now going to have to be compliant with something, whether it be I mean, uh, you know the healthcare industry or the uh, the big data industry or whether it be credit card industry, they all have a compliance of some sort. So there's an in it, it, there's a checkbox there that you have to fill out for PCI, for HIPAA, for PII, which is personal identifiable information, and uh, WTF and all that because compliance is not real security. Yeah, you know, and obviously hacker has been in the news a lot because of the groups, you know, because of anonymous and lawsec. But the thing is, it's not actually a bad word, which I'm sure a lot of you. Know. So those were a lot of buzzwords in one thing. So now we're going to move into some network topics. Got to put that picture of a dirty server rack. You always have to do that if necessary. So here, some real quick topics which need to be covered when you're talking about network security. Hardware configurations, firewalls, uh, monitoring of your network, making sure you know what's going on, IDS, IPS, which is intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, prevention systems, um, knowing what's what on the network entirely, whether it be the devices that are on it, the security that's on it, um, having a full view of your external network, your internal network, um, keeping things updated, and passwords. And here are the best practices for all of the above. So for hardware configurations, changing defaults, and configuring appropriately to make sure that people can't hop in just by because of a default password or a default port that was left open. Uh, when you're doing firewalls, a lot of people like to ignore egress filtering, but it's probably one of the more most important things right after ingress filtering. If you're going to be doing that, then you need to have things that block outgoing traffic just as much. And a lot of people, a lot of system administrators overlook that. Um, like I said about monitoring, watch what's up. A lot of people don't realize the benefits that you can gain from actually having monitoring systems in place in your network to tell you what your network is doing, tell you what data is going where, where the traffic is heading, where the uh, pitfalls of the network are, where things that are um, misconfigured. Uh, the IDS, IPS are pretty, it's pretty uh, obvious. It's going to detect, watch, and defend your network, but they also need to be configured uh, properly and securely because an IDS, IPS can be evaded. Um, knowing what's what, like I said, so Right now, if I were to tell uh, the people who are system administrators, network administrators, if I were to tell you to tell me all of your IP ranges right now, you most likely know most of them, but so does every other company that I've done a pen test for, and then we end up finding something, and then they're like, oh, that whole 255 IP addresses that we gave you were the one range, that's not actually ours, so we're glad you just hacked it, and, and you know, we could have went to jail for all that, and because we're illegally hacking an IP address range that the company wasn't aware of, that's pretty common in the pen test world. Um, so, and uh, for your system and your network configurations, apply updates. I mean, I know it's sometimes scary because downtime can happen, but the thing is it's worth it because having downtime is better than being hacked. Went back, whoops. And then passwords, of course, change them. So, as a hacker, what are we gonna do to your network as far as security goes? Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. So, we're gonna be searching, sniffing, spoofing, scanning, hopping, and popping. Essentially, it's gonna start with uh, a search and that URL at the top there will pull our death that search string right there into Google will pull, if you had your company and then passwords.txt, if there was a passwords file sitting out there that someone just named and threw out on a share somewhere, or threw it up on a web root, it's gonna pop up with that sort of Google hacking and people don't actually realize the severity of what and things you can find just by Googling for something like passwords.txt. I just had a, um, a pen test I did for a really large school down in the south and they gave us 3,000 IP addresses, and we went through the whole, all 3,000 of them um, over the course of two or three weeks. Found a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of uh, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, a lot of crap like that. Um, and then we realized towards the end we should just Google a couple other things about the network, and we ended up finding a file sitting out on a exploits website from 2004 that had a list of about 50 SQL injections that were still live, and the, the, they were live from 2004. So at this point, we can assume that this particular client had already been hacked for seven years. So then our next remediation and our, our first our first finding in the report was prior system compromised, go talk to a skilled incident response team because they're, I'm sure that there's something um, sitting on your network that shouldn't be, not to mention that the things that were in that file were not in the scope that they gave us. I can't imagine why, other than the fact that they were embarrassed. Um, we're also going to be sniffing on your network, and HTTPS won't save you. I'm sure a lot of you know that there are ways to sniff a network without, uh, even that are using HTTPS on the protocol when doing uh, web browsing. There's ways to actually strip that out, sniff the traffic anyway. Uh, we'll be doing network spoofing. The dog says ARP, and then by that I mean we're going to be doing ARP spoofing, trying to impersonate other computers to intercept traffic. Uh, we'll be scanning your network. We'll see you like port 1433, essentially just getting at the fact that doing uh, network scanning will lead to a bunch of 
open ports and open vulnerabilities that you can pop into. 1433, if you don't know, is Microsoft SQL. And that's a nice um, starting point. If that's listening, we can try to crack the default passwords. Um, hopping, we're going to be hopping on the network. A lot of people don't realize, and system administrators, network administrators, when they're giving us a pen test, um, or they realize that there's a dev box out there, and they say, oh, that, that's a dev box. It's no big deal if they hack it. There's nothing on it. However, we can utilize that development box or that uh, the, un the compromise box that may not have all the security of your production boxes, and then use it to hop into the production boxes because of uh, files that may be on it or permissions it has uh, you know, to make, be a trusted computer on the network or has SSH keys that can get into other servers or Harvard has holds credentials that the developer put on the box. And then uh, Dave, Dave walked in the room a couple minutes ago, so we're going to be popping boxes. He's not even paying attention. He's talking to Adrian. Um, we're going to talk a little about all the physical security. Uh, Nauticon proves your locks suck. I mean, there's uh, lock picking rooms here every year, and for forty dollars, anyone can get into your uh, any room that you can think of with a uh, with a lock pick set, as long as assuming, of course, that you choose a regular lock. There's a couple diagrams, a picture of a nice uh, table at a lock pick village, and of course, a diagram of picking a lock. If you need uh, to learn that. And it's a very fun thing to do, whether it's part of your job or whether you just want to learn it for fun. It's a lot of fun to pick up and do, picking locks, picking handcuffs. Um, so if you have cameras, you have motion sensors, you can grab a cereal box. And this this is a funny slide. It kind of only strikes, uh, strikes me, but we were, the old uh, consulting firm I worked at from Cleveland here, it's Hurricane Lab. Um, my old boss told us to break in one night with the pen test team. So me and two other people on the pen test team ended up breaking into the office just to see. He was trying to judge our skill to see whether he could sell in a physical penetration test. So we were told to break into the office, and we got in, and we noticed that the motion sensors only went off if you moved more than like two or three steps at a time. So we would scuffle along the floor really slowly, really slowly, until we got up to the camera. And the only thing we could find around was an empty cereal box. So we just put the cereal box in front of the camera and the motion sensor. So it's a little funny. But um, for cameras, it's pretty easy to evade with a simple laser pointer. They can, uh, you can point it at a camera. And some of them have ways to deflect that. But essentially, if you point it at a, at a, at a camera, it'll be blocking the image. Um, motion sensors can be subverted by, like I just said, they can't have them too sensitive, especially if the building is in another office building where other people might be walking by the door, like ours, for example. The place I was breaking into had um, a glass door in the front, so it couldn't be too sensitive that it would see people walking by the glass door and go off. So it had to be toned down just a little bit, and because of that, you could move two or three steps at a time, stop, because you would see it had a warning light. It would go green, yellow, and red, and it would hit yellow, which means it was about to go off, but if you stopped, waited five, ten seconds, you would reset back down to green, and you could continue moving. So um, cameras and motion sensors, bypassable, unless it's an extreme case where people have configured them to be very, very, very secure. Um, for as far as badges go, we don't need no stinking badges. Take a picture, make a rough copy, follow someone in. It's way, way beyond easy. I mean, people don't pay attention to who's walking in the door behind you. Badges are really easy to create fake ones of. It's not a difficult process. Of course, if you have an RFID badge that need to be scanned in or something like that, that's a little different. But that taking care of following someone in, tailgating someone into the door takes care of that problem. Uh, required viewing for this kind of things is actually uh, sneakers and hackers, and a lot of people give breaking in whack, but I think it's a pretty good show. A lot of people in our industry like to, you know, say that they're like the the biggest and baddest, so a show about it and say, oh, that that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. Well, of course it's unrealistic. It's a TV show. People are going to want to watch it to have fun. They're not going to want to watch it to see you browsing Reddit for four hours a day. <laughs> they want they want to see what actually the the fun stuff going on, not like the stupid crap that we do on a daily basis anyway. So, but these three movies have a lot of fun hacker stuff and a lot of fun physical security stuff. That's why I figured I'd mention them in the physical security section. So we're going to talk on the web application. So you can see where this talk is going. I'm talking very fast about very small amount of topics. If anyone has any questions or wants me to expand a little bit, just raise your hand and I'll try to talk more about whatever it is I'm talking about. So for web applications, there's one rule that I think everyone needs to understand when you are doing development of applications or testing applications. But mainly, if you're doing development on this one rule that really covers a lot of things all at once, you need to sanitize all your input. All of it. Sanitize it. Anything that comes from a user, an untrusted database, an untrusted data source of any sort, 
sanitize the input. Make sure, it, it, give it a sanity check, first of all, and then secondly, make sure it's what the server or what the application is expecting. Don't let bad characters in, don't let bad data in, things that don't make sense. If there's a phone number, it should only be 10 characters. It shouldn't be 15. So don't allow 15, unless, of course, I mean, if you need uh, international, you also have to write a regex for that. But um, for the most part, you can expect what something is going to look like and sanitize it. Make sure it matches those. And if you uh, don't believe me, very simple attack, which I'm sure everyone in the room is aware of, but cross-site scripting. Basically, it's a parameter on an application, takes user input. It's not sanitized. So if you're entering your name, they're not checking to see that it looks like a name. Uh, and then it eventually will reflect it back to the user at some point in the application. So it took a name, and it reflects it on the page, or reflects it in a form, or a submission form. Here's a good example of it. So site.com, profile.aspx. Can everyone read that? Yeah. Um, essentially, it's asking for my name, so I put in Rick there. So this same application, if it's not doing any sanity checking and not doing any validation on what I'm entering, you can enter Rick and then that iframe source tag, which essentially will I'll pop up an iframe in the middle of the page or whatever it's reflecting back to the virus.html or whatever server you can have, whatever script you want to put up there. And that, pop, and that happens all the time. It's one of the most common vulnerabilities I've seen in doing web application testing. And it, the severity of it is not super intense. I mean, it can be, but a lot of people take it as, you know, um, uh, it's, it's just reflecting back. It's not that big a deal, things of that nature. And they don't want to fix it just because, of, uh, you know, it doesn't really have a great impact right away. But usually, if they're not sanitizing input on, for, you know, on uh, parameters on web pages, they're probably not sanitizing input throughout the entire application. So it's going to be a big deal somewhere. So the fix, sanitize all the input received from the user or, like I said, a trusted data source, or untrusted data source or a database. And I say that because if your application is pulling information from a database and then rendering it on the page, you know your database is secure, right? Well, you don't really know that. Because if anyone were to compromise the database, if anyone were to compromise any sort of that data or being able to enter it from another application or another portion of it, it's not necessarily safe data. So you have to make sure that for any untrusted data source that's not completely secure is also sanitized. All the input from it is taken check for sanity, check for input. Um, Client-side validation doesn't count. If you have a JavaScript on your page that's doing validation that says, hey, you entered a one instead of a letter-only field, it doesn't work. It can be intercepted. It can be uh, captured. The request can be captured. It can be removed. So JavaScript or client-side validation does not work. Don't trust anything from the client. Still not convinced? Here's an a example of SQL injection. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's heard of SQL injection, too. But essentially, you're creating, you're creating a dynamic query on your web page that's going to query a database. The queries contain input from the user. So a user puts their name in, and typically you would be querying, OK, so if the user is Rick, then let him into the application, compares it to the database, compares your access that's in the database, and says, OK, you can come into the application, no problem. If it's not sanitized and doesn't check for if I'm just entering my name and not special characters, then they control your query. Not only do they control your query, they also own the server. Um, this is an example. So the top one is a very, very basic, like almost pseudocode, just quick SQL query. So select everything from users where name equal Rick. The bottom one is select everything from users where name, and then the, the last characters there have been entered instead of my name. So we went to enter a single tick, or single tick one equals one, and then um, a terminator of the line. And essentially, what that'll do is says, OK, you lobbed off the, the query. So now we don't, we're not asking for Rick. We're starting a whole other portion of the query that we created. And 1 will always equal 1. So it's always going to return true. So if your authentication mechanism is just something using a query just like this and not sanitizing the input from my name, or whatever input is put in, rather, if 1 equals 1 always true, it's just going to let me into the application as someone in the database, usually the top record. So it completely bypass the authentication and just let you in because one is one equals one is always true. Um, and what I said in this slide about owning your server, SQL injection now due to um, things great things like Backtrack and Metasploit, it's easy to actually upload shell code byte by byte into a database and then have it execute. So a shell code, if you if you're not aware, will allow an attacker to open a shell into the computer and or the server and, and be able to control it remotely 
from another computer. It's, it's a lot more complex than that, but essentially that's what shellcode is if you're not aware. Shellcode could do a number of things too. It doesn't just have to do that. But that's what the ultimate goal is going to be. If you can over, take over a computer and get a shell on the machine, a terminal on the machine, that's what you're going to be trying to go for. SQL injection is a big deal. And then, of course, the fix, sanitizing all input. And then for this particular example, when you're doing um, SQL queries, use parameterized queries and sort procedures. Not going to touch on those at the moment, but look them up if you're not aware and you are a developer, which I would hope if you're a developer doing SQL queries, you already know what these are. Very basic. Um, this is a cool vulnerability that not everyone knows how to exploit completely. So it's called remote file inclusion. This is an example. I'm fairly certain the code is readable up there. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's basically looking for color.php, and it's including a file on the server that because the color name.php, right? So if you don't properly um, check for authentication mechanisms and properly sanitize the input that's put into this, you can do directory traversal. So I'm going to run through. This is really, really down to four steps. But um, essentially, if you have vulnerable.php and you're looking for a color and you don't sanitize what is, uh, what, like you're not checking to see if only the person is requesting color.php, like green.php or blue.php, you can use it to read files off the server. You can include a local file off the server. Um, so in this particular example, I'm looking from bar log Apache. But you could also do you know Etsy password and pull the password file. But the reason why it's interesting why you want to access bar log Apache is because if you can create a error or some sort of log that gets uh, added to this Apache log, and you include in that error or that log a PHP shellcode, so you just put it in line in your error, when you go back to view to the top URL again and you look at log Apache, if you have um, a PHP shellcode in the log, since you're opening it through a browser, it'll actually use the PHP interpreter, and it will interpret the PHP as the shellcode, and it'll actually execute it. So you'll be able to have a shell on the machine because the PHP interpreter actually took your shellcode and ran it on the server. It's it's a complex it's a, well it's kind of a complex vulnerability. It's a complex exploit, and it um, is a lot of fun because a lot of people don't realize. Okay, you can use directory traversal on my PHP application. It's using a, a file include, which is dangerous. And you can access my Etsy password or a config file with a password in it. And sure, that's cool. But um, the real cool thing is, is if you're able to put PHP shellcode and get it to log to the Apache log and then view the Apache log, it interprets it and you have a shell. So, you know, step one, visit it. Step two, create an Apache log with that shellcode. Step three, step four, shell or profit. So on top of what we're talking about web applications, you can't ignore the OWASP top 10. OWASP is an awesome organization that does all web application vulnerabilities, web application security projects. Um, so this is the top 10. It starts with injection, referring to SQL injection, um, which I just covered, cross-site scripting I just covered, broken authentication and session management. Um, that essentially means one way or another the application is not handling your session properly, whether that means they're putting in a predictable cookie value that's actually controlling your session, or whether it means you can uh, impersonate another user relatively easily, or any sort of broken authentication method that can be bypassed. Uh, insecure direct object reference. If I'm a user at a bank, ABC Bank, and I'm looking, and my user number record is 001, if I can change the application to 002 and see someone else's record, that's almost just pretty much a direct object reference, and that's kind of what, and the, the, that's a big vulnerability that happens. Uh, Cross-site request forgery essentially is executing a request on a logged in user's behalf. So if I have, if you're logged into your bank and it's vulnerable to cross-site request forgery, I can send you to a page that I've created, and it will automatically post data on your behalf. So if I know the form that you're looking at is transfer $10,000 from account A to account B, and somehow I send you an email or I send you a link or one way or another you can click a malicious link that I've created, I can post the data on your behalf. You will never see it. You'll click my link, it'll execute the post I've created, and it will do the bank transfer for you without you ever even knowing that you did it, depending on... And it's really surprising how many sites are vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. I find them every single pen test. And the thing is, I think some people don't even know how to test for it. They know how to... A lot of pen testers know how to talk about it, actually, but they don't know how to test for it, and it's really easy to test for. Really easy to test for. Um, A6 is the, the sixth number. Uh, I mean, the sixth topic is security misconfiguration, and that can be as simple as leaving a default password or um, 
having something misconfigured where you can view view files or view users or access administration consoles or you know bypass an administration login mis misconfiguration of the application or the environment Apache you know the MySQL instance whatever it may be insecure crypto cryptographic storage a lot of people overlook this but essentially the most uh, the biggest vulnerability I see with that is people putting credentials database credentials into an include file or a configuration file and not encrypting them and if someone were to ever get access to those files like say using a directory traversal attack like I showed you can get sensitive credentials out of the unencrypted um, include files or config files and then use them against the rest of the server the rest of the environment what have you Failure to restrict, restrict URL access, that's pretty easy. Simple is, um, say you have a page that's only for administrative users, and you click a link on the page that says, okay, log into your administrative page, and you have to log in, and you need credentials. Doing proper credential checking, it's making sure you have access and you're authorized to view the page. But what if the page that it redirects to is just admin.html, and you can just browse directly to ad, admin.html, and it doesn't prompt you to see, or, or maybe better off like, uh, slash admin slash network.html to do a network configuration change on whatever it is you're looking at. And if you don't have uh, restricted access to that URL, it doesn't matter whether you have an authentication because they can just directly go visit that URL. So that's a really big problem. I mean, it seems stupid, but it pops up. Um, insufficient transport layer protection. That's pretty basic, straightforward. Unvalidated redirects and forwards. Um, essentially, that would be like if you're redirecting to a page and you don't check where you can redirect, well then someone could insert google.com or their own web page and it'll look like it'll look like your URL is valid, you know, from abcbank.com, but the redirect is supposed to go to another page within the bank or another page that they have, but you put it in your own, you know, you redirect it to your malicious website. So that's the OWASP top 10. Other failures that I would just like to mention that I don't think OWASP covers more directly, default passwords and configs, it says security misconfiguration, but we really need to get that across. People really like to leave default passwords on certain things like, you know, Tomcat installations or uh, MySQL or MS SQL. They'll put the passwords as default passwords. Any sort of passwords and configs that are default should be changed, modified to your environment, and definitely made secure because most of the time they're, they're there so they're easily configurable. They're not there to be secure. They need to be changed. Directory, directory listing enabled, that's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty easy thing to fix on any web server. It's very simple to disable directory listing. And that would be as if um, you're visiting a page and you went to the root of a directory and it just listed out all, the, all of the files in the folders and then you could probably browse to the rest of the ones on the server as well and access any file, view very sensitive information in config files. Um, that, that It's really easy to turn off and it's a problem that a lot of people have. Readable files, say you have the server misconfigured and you can read a PHP file instead of executing it. And like so, so you have a config.php and it has passwords in it. And normally if the server was configured to actually interpret those, it would just display a blank page because it's trying to interpret something that's a config file. But if it's misconfigured, you can read it, see things in it. Improper file handling it goes along the same way. If your application is never going to see a .exe file, you should have something uh, something so it will never be able to upload, read, download any sort of those those sort of files. There should be a mechanism put in place that will disable that file handling. Source disclosure, a lot of uh, people, developers like to leave random bits of source and backup files or things of that nature that are still on the web root so people can just go look at your source code. It happens all the time. Old software, that's pretty obvious. Your Whatever your installation is, whatever you're using is old. It needs to be updated. File uploads, um, they're difficult to get right. That's kind of the problem that developers have. To make them perfectly secure, it's, it's, it's difficult to make them right. You have to follow a best practice guide. You should follow OWASP examples. You should make sure you're restricting access to only the files which should be able to upload to. You're not able to control the content of the file uh, beyond, you know, obviously the file itself. Once it's posted, you know, shouldn't be able to control the content. You shouldn't be able to control where it can upload. You shouldn't be able to control the name of it. It should not be going to a temporary file. It should not be given a name that is... Um, guessable if it gets, it's getting renamed into something and see a lot of those. So um, that was web application security. It took a little longer than 60 seconds, but I tried to pick each topic for that long. Um, operating system security. So this slide's going to make everyone mad. <laughs> Let's just be reasonable about it. Um, Mac, greater than Linux, greater than Windows. And that's my personal opinion. It's meant to be mostly a joke. but. Um, Linux and, and Mac OS are typically more secure, depending on what your habit. I mean, it's not something you can say overall, and a lot of people will like to, to hate on it and say that, oh, that's not true. They're just as insecure. And you're right. They, they can be just as insecure. But on average, 
you're going to find many more vulnerabilities in a Windows installation that somebody's running than you would a Mac or Linux. And this particular slide is just my personal preference. I used to be a Linux only user, and then I got a Mac. And now I won't ever do anything else. I love my Mac. It's, it's pretty, it's a pretty interface on top of Linux. What more could you ask for, essentially? It's a, it's a Unix underneath it all, FreeBSD. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a no brainer for me. And then Windows, I can't even stand you. Um, moving into penetration testing, which is my day job. So I figured I would talk about this for a little while. Essentially, if you don't know what penetration testing is, other than a dirty sounding job title, it's finding a weakness before someone else does. And it's kind of a big deal. We in the industry believe that it's you know one of the first steps you need to be taking in order to make sure that your corporation and your environment, your enterprise is secure. Um, what is going to happen is they're going to pay a consulting firm or a penetration tester, or uh, they're going to have their own penetration testing security team. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at your network, your systems, your configurations as a hacker. Try to hack in, find a vulnerability, find a problem, report it back to you so you can fix it. So before LulzSec Anonymous comes and attacks your corporation, you've already had these fixed because a an ethical hacker, a person who's a penetration tester, came in and told you what your problems were. Here's the unofficial types of penetration testing. This is my unofficial type. You won't find these on the internet. I made them up. But they're the types of penetration testing that I believe exist. The scam. You can start with just scanning your network using port scanning, vulnerability scanning, web application scanners. Take those results, try to the inter 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 interpret them into something that your developers, your system administrators can read and use. Difficult to do because a lot of the scanners like to put out, I'll give you tons of output, and really all you need is one paragraph out of the whole thing that shows you the port, the, you know, the host, the port, what they found, how to reproduce it, and a little how to fix it. How to fix it, and not all the other fluff that comes with the vulnerability scanner, web application scanners. Um, that is a valid means of penetration testing, but you're not going to get a lot of out of it. The manual penetration test, which would be a mixture of starting with a scan and then going to take all of those, validating them manually to make sure that they actually exist, and then also giving you better remediation, better examples of how to exploit them, better impact. If, if there's a, a vulnerability that exists, say, SQL injection, and all the, the example does, to show you that, oh, we could reflect something back on the page using the SQL query. And we, we just kind of pulled, we pulled the database record out that said uh, Bob Joe's name. I mean, that's impactful because you're actually accessing the database. But if a manual penetration tester goes in and he gets a shell and can show you your entire file system, including your password and sensitive files that are on the machine, that's way more impactful. So a manual penetration test is the way to go when you're going to look at the basics of a penetration test. Um, physical and social penetration test kind of what it sounds like. Say your corporation is very sensitive as far as whether or not someone can actually access the building after hours. Like, can someone break in and get past the alarms, break in through the roof, subvert whatever sort of security systems you have, and you want to test that? Like, say, a bank. That's very important to them. That's a physical penetration test. Social engineering, a social penetration test would essentially be the same sort of deal, trying to get access, but they're going to be using your people against you. They're going to try to call and get information out of your bank tellers, or they're going to try to call, get information out of an IT administrator. They're going to try to convince them that you are an okay person to do whatever it is you're trying to do. You know, convince them that they need to give you their password, or they need to give you, you know, this bit of information or let you in. And then the last one I would call is a full-on penetration test, and that would be a scan. It would be a manual penetration test. It would be a physical and a social and a penetration test. And then it would also include source code, or not source code, but, but applications. I mean, you can do a manual penetration test that includes your applications, but a full-on penetration test would include all of your applications, meeting with your developers, getting source code, going through the source code line by line, trying to figure out the vulnerabilities that exist so you can get a full understanding of how secure your corporation is. Um, Individually, they're useful, but all together, it's key. The phases of a penetration test, I'm not going to explain every single bit of them. Uh, reconnaissance, initially starting by looking on Google, not physically touching the servers at all, not even pinging them, not even visiting the website, using Google, a Google cache, using Google to find information about your environment, your network, your web application, whatever. Discovery and passive, which would be actually visiting the page. Profiling the page, going page by page, just like any user would, looking at the entire um, web application, looking at the machine, looking at, OK, we're looking at, uh, there's 10 machines here, and three of them have you know, MySQL running. Like, Can I just browse to the page and see that a page that's running? Or can I just look at the ports and connect them with FTP? Can I connect with the telnet? Very passive discovery. And then scanning, 
which would actually be configuring a network vulnerability scanner, a web application scanner, a port scanner to go through the entire network, the entire range of whatever you're giving them, and looking for vulnerabilities, open ports, and things we can exploit. At this point, we're no longer passive. We're hammering your network with a number of scanning devices and scanning tools to see what vulnerabilities and what ports are open so we can figure out a way to attack. Exploitation, the next step, the exploitation. So finding a vulnerability, finding one of these open ports, being able to exploit the servers, being able to exploit the software running, being able to exploit the web application vulnerability that exists, um, and actually getting into the network, penetrating the network. Post-exploitation, which would be taking one of those vulnerabilities once we've inside the network one way or another, inside the application, using it to try to get outside of that area. So if you're in an application, it, try to access other applications. If you're in the, you've hacked into the network, try to hop off that machine to get to any other machine you can get to in the network or pull data off of a file share, whatever that server has access to post-exploitation. Um, and this is a pen test, so we're not being malicious. So cleanup is also important. We want to make sure that if we put something on the server, like a shell or shell code, that we don't let it sit there so some random hacker, we didn't just make some other hacker's job easy, a really an, a malicious hacker. We didn't leave a shell code on there that someone can just you know, a back door that they can just connect to right away. We want to make sure you clean up all of your files. If you put on a password dumping, uh, like a, a password dump tool on a Windows machine, you delete all that stuff. Get rid of all the traces of that because one, it's not your job to hose up the server. It's just your job to look at it and to make sure that, you know, you tell them what the vulnerabilities are. And you do make an impact and you do run those tools, but you clean up when you're done. You're not trying to leave 10 more hours of work for the system administrators just because you were having fun. And then um, the last step beyond that would be reporting, which is a very big deal. So I'll touch on them in a second. Failures of penetration testing, paying too much for too little, um, paying way too much for a pen test from a junior uh, junior analyst or a junior team, um, not really getting your full money's worth. The smash and grab method, which is um, coming into a network, coming into a web application, and breaking everything as much as possible, and then saying, we hacked in and got all your passwords. And that's it. You don't tell them like how or why or what they can do to fix it. You just walk in, break it, and say, "We did this." You know, here's here's the you know here's the list of things we found. You know, good luck. And p companies actually do that, which is just ridiculous. That's that's just it's it's beyond it's beyond comprehension to me how someone could pay some a company and have them do that. Right? And I know companies that still do that to this day. It's not like they don't do it anymore. They still do that. It's ridiculous. Um, a lack of experience, kind of what I mentioned before. What was that? Uh, I'm not going to say. Um, they're they're not really around here, but uh, lack of experience, kind of what I talked about in the first time. If you have a pen tester who's not experienced enough, and they do break things, bring down systems, and then as I said, reporting or remediation. I think everyone fails at. I even think the company I work at fails at it from time to time. We're getting better, but there's some things that reporting needs to happen so that companies can actually act on what we've given them once we've hacked in. So if we, we provide actionable items, to, so actually. Like, you know, instead of just saying we hacked in and this is what happens, um, we give them, we hacked in, this is what you can do to fix it. Detailed findings. So we hacked in, how do we hack in? Step by step. Not just, oh, we, we hacked in via an open port on MySQL server and we got in and we hacked in this way. Like, we tell them. We connected to the MySQL server, we reviewed it, we viewed that it had, um, was running out of root account because we tested root and it said invalid password, then we guessed the password. Then we got in, we dumped this database, we modified this record, we used this to do this step by step. Remove the fluff. Um, a lot of times people in reports will include a bunch of data from a scanner that's completely worthless. Just get rid of it. They don't want to read it. Executive teams don't want to read it. Development teams don't want to read it. Nobody wants to read that stuff. It's worthless. Get rid of it. Um, provide help after you've delivered the report. Um, if they have questions, don't say, oh, you know, we, we got to the report. Like, read it. It's done. Talk to them. Talk to the developers. Talk to their executive team. Talk to their system administrators. Help them fix it. You aren't just a person who gets to hack in and break stuff. You need to be able to help them, too. Be concise and consistent. A lot of times, companies will rewrite findings every time they have a report. The thing is with that is you say they do two pen tests for the same company, and they don't have consistent reports. It's just unprofessional. It, it's, it's an unprofessional way to do things. And be concise with what you're talking about. Don't, again, don't give too much fluff and don't try to pad something with a bunch of information that doesn't make sense. Give them the information they, the information they need, make it look consistent, and have it be consistent. Um, use English properly. It's, it's sometimes, as technical people, we don't, we're, we're like, we're maybe we don't care too much about how we speak or how we write, but it's important 
to remain, or re remain professional while you're doing this and make sure that everything has been looked at. You haven't missed a word. You haven't mistyped something. Have a QA session happen from someone who's more senior than you or have someone else QA it who's at the same level or QA it yourself. You know, quality assurance. Make sure it's something you would want to give to someone to read. And then a lot of people think pretty is useless. It's not completely useless. Make the report 50% pretty, 50% data. Um, where does printed penetration just think fit into securing code? So again, scanning. I'm running a little low on time here, so I'm going to go a little quicker, like I should have been initially. No one's been yelling at me. Um, scanning, you need to be able to do web application scanning, take code, do static analysis on the code to find vulnerabilities within it. Um, and then beyond that, once you have that, which is really just like doing a web application or a network scanner against your, your network, you need to have someone manually go in and look at your logic and business flaws that make this. So, in an application, sure, there's all, you know, the way the data pulls into the application and whether we sanitize it or not is all in the code. But what about a password reset that someone programmed incorrectly? Not because they did it incorrectly from, like, a technical standpoint, because the business logic doesn't make sense. Like, you can reset the password without having a bit of information or being able to subvert a portion of the application because someone did the business logic wrong. It's a lot to it, and it requires a very skilled um, code analysis from a penetration. Um, and then show them how to do it right, like I talked about before. Help the developer, you know, help the developers create something secure. And help develop a security development life cycle. If you've never heard of this before, basically, well, I'm going to show you. This is what it looks like. Right? You everybody got that? Okay, cool. And what, this is what it actually is. It's, it's uh, the security development life cycle is a process which encompasses the addition of a series of security focused activities and deliverables to each of the phases of the development process. Very wordy, but really what it means is, as you're developing, you have security check. That's all it means. So you develop a portion application. Someone else with security background looks at it and says, this is secure. This, every portion of the application ties together, and this is secure. Move on to the next step. And then when you get to the final steps, have a full penetration test done before you go to production. And that's kind of how, in a nutshell, there's way more to it, as you just saw. But in a nutshell, security checks at every step of the development process. And everyone has a development process, so you need to implement security from the ground up not as a tacked on thing at the end, and that's what an SDLC will help you do. So how do you become a penetration tester, if anyone in here is wondering? How do you get a cool job like this where you break stuff and then sip the slides so you can't read it? Um, Self-study. A lot of it is taking the time outside of your work, out of your school, whatever it is you're doing, and studying on your own. Playing, looking, reading books, reading blogs, listening to podcasts. Um, get a mentor. Find a security person who's really uh, teaches at your level because sometimes people will teach but you don't understand like you don't like the way they teach find a person who wants to be your mentor and they are on the same level with you in a teaching method talk to them get information from them let them um, help you read a lot like read everything you possibly can related to security even not security just read reading helps a lot and then more self-study I'm not kidding you really need to self-study you can't pick this stuff up just by taking a couple courses taking by certification it's not going to happen um, you need a dark basement you need to be able to some place you can go where you're alone and focused and you have your mind set on what you're looking at and not are distracted by a million things. This sort of thing, once you learn it, you can be distracted by things and still continue working and still your, in your process, but you need some time on your own to look at this stuff. Practice. And in my, my little sub-note there is legally where you're allowed, preferably a lab. Don't practice on the internet unless it's fine. Is that the lab that they set up just for us? <laughs> The whole China network is, is something that's a lab. You can have fun on it. Um, hacks, hacking is a, a uh, an art form. So I have a picture of Bob, Bob Ross and his happy tree because it really is an art form when you're hacking. And it starts with Google. So I kind of talked about it before, but this are two basic queries that are just very, very, very easy Google queries that are going to give you a bunch of crazy information. As you can see, the top one is index of and password. So essentially, what those 113,000 results are going to pull up is a, uh, a listing of places that have a password file sitting somewhere in a directory listing. Simple as that. There's passwords in there. But some of them, since it's an Etsy password, some of them might not actually have passwords in it. And they might have been the shadow. But the point is that these files are available, which means if you can find this file somewhere, most likely you're going to find a number of other things too. This is a very sensitive file. So the next one I also have is in URL admin, in URL password, and the file type text. So anywhere in the URL, if it says admin password and a text file, obviously you're going to find something cool there. So, and there's 130 results of those. That's a, that's pretty a small amount, but if you think about it, in the URL it says admin, and it says password, and it's a text file. 
I can almost guarantee something's cool and it's gonna it's gonna come out of one of those. Um, the reconnaissance portion is scanning, inspecting, poking, prodding, and exploring. When you're doing recon on the, the networks, the recon on the machines you're hacking, the web application, just do as much exploring without hacking. Don't try to just throw a bunch of exploits at it and try to break in. Look at it. Understand it. See how it works. It's like this. Blank blank. You need to look at, the, look at it and explore it and understand it. Um, this is a diagram of where to start. Again, I hope you guys all got that. Um, Basically, what I'm saying to, by that point is before you exploit, you're going to have a million ways in. You're going to see a million ways you can go. You need to pick the best, most quick way, which is accurate, which means if you're going to be exploiting and you think it's going to take you 50,000 tries of, a, of using this exploit that you've pre-coded or downloaded off the internet, that's really heavy on the network. They can see that. They're going to see the traffic. They're going to see someone trying to hack in. Exploit the most quick thing. Exploit the thing that's going to accurately, one or two tries, it's going to get in it's done. And then maintain the access. Do it quickly. Do it cleanly. It's, it's, it's part of it. So when you're looking at your vector list, when you've created one and looked at all your recon, and you decide, well, this is, this is a way in, this is a way in, this is a way in. Quick, get the one that you think is going to be most quick, most accurate, and then also add in a little bit most impactful. Like, what am I going to find by looking at this? So what is a way to do that? Well, you could use Metasploit, and that's a valid way of doing it. If you don't know what Metasploit is, do some Googling. Um, there's a lot of experts on Metasploit at this conference currently, so there's a lot of people that can talk to you about that. But me personally, I think it's a little more of your brain. You don't necessarily need the exploits that are, that are in Metasploit to hack a network or hack an application or hack a uh, you know, server. Use your brain. You know, find the things online. Try to understand the exploit before you go about trying to exploit it with just some random tool. Uh, like I said, post-exploitation. Gather, gather um, before you're going to be gathering information from the other portions of the server, like other portions of the network, other portions of the application environment. Grab that information and then do your cleanup. Don't leave things like this. When you're actually doing a pen testing and doing hacks, this kind of stuff obviously is impactful. It gets on the news because the Albanian hackers hacked this website. But this is not what you actually want to do unless you like jail. Um, a little bit of social engineering. Basically, if you want to copy this slide deck, you should just send me your corporate email, your position, your boss's name, and your employee number, and I'll send this over to you. Everyone got that? All right, cool. That's essentially social engineering in and of itself, like getting too much information out of somebody that they shouldn't be giving out. That stuff can be used. I could easily, you know, call your boss and say, I am you, especially in a big corporation, if they don't know you personally. Say, like, hi up, boss. This, uh, this, this, this essentially is social engineering. Hacking also means radio hacking, coding hacking, you know, like being a, a, a hacker that doesn't just write exploits, but, like, they find a cool way to write an application. Coding hacking is a big deal. Um, hardware hacking in general. Food hacking. I mean, hacking is a mindset. Hacking is not like you need to be hacking into computers. You can hack anything. Hacking is looking at something and then trying to figure out a way to make it do something it was never intended to do. And it's a mindset for everything. It doesn't necessarily mean you're breaking in anywhere or stealing data or making someone's life miserable. You are just simply looking at something and then taking your perspective and twisting it around, flipping it upside down and looking at it from that perspective, figuring out a way to make it do what you want it to do. More importantly, more than anything, I said it's a mindset, but there also is brain hacking. There are ways to teach yourself things that you never knew you could do within your brain. Help you meditate, help you learn, help you research, help you study. There are ways that you can actually hack your brain. And Hacking is a, simply a mindset. There's nothing to it that says what I do on a day-to-day -day is the only hacking that exists. There's a million hackers out there, and some of them probably don't even know that they're doing. People that hack video games, like uh, you know, around the corner, we're doing video game hacking. I mean, hacking—it's—it's it's, it's a very—it's a very big subject that doesn't have a real definition. And then for everything else, there's Mastercard, and I threw this in because I think it—it's it, funny, but it's also a lot of times people think and corporations think that when it comes to hacking, penetration testing, security, all you do is toss money at it and it'll get better, and that's not what's going to happen. People need to learn to make it better. People need to understand, and that's how security will get better in corporations, how pen testers will get better, how we're all going to get better. We all just need to learn and not spend the money on the corporation spending money trying to fix one problem when it takes just one knowledgeable person to actually fix it or tell them how to. Um, Gaining knowledge on the whole topic of everything I just talked about, conferences, and hey, we happen to be at a conference. Doing this kind of stuff is very no a great way to gain knowledge. Training, offensive security, ISC squared, SANS, all good training organizations will come up online. Getting certifications, iffy topic. Not everyone agrees. I think they're useful, but at the same time, you shouldn't think just because you have certifications, you run the world. 
They're useful in getting a job. They're useful in teaching you some information. They're not the end all be all. School, same in, in uh, I'm kind of strange when it comes to that. I don't necessarily believe everyone needs to go to school to understand this stuff. I don't, I, I mean, I never finished my degree, just to be honest. And um, I, I, I st did start going and I realized it wasn't helping. So I just kind of went off and got a full-time job instead of doing, as a network administrator was my first job. So school is good, and if, if you learn better in school, that might be the way you need to take the approach. I did so. Um, podcasts and blogs. Podcasts seems like they've gone on the wayside. For a while, they were really big, but you can still find some cool security podcasts, read security blogs. Um, creativity and curiosity is the biggest way you're going to gain knowledge, using your creativity and your curiosity to look at something, break something, learn something new. It all, it all starts with you. I mean, no one else can force you to learn. So, And then, of course, the Internet. The Internet's a whole big, vast Knowledge base. You can learn anything you need to. Um, my thoughts on everything, essentially, just, you know, everything I've t covered here, I think security is important in every single thing that we do. It's going to gain importance as we progress. It's going to, you know, I think everyone should be aware of it, whether it be uh, a 60 year old individual who works at a machine shop or, you know, the newest kid out of high school. Like, security is going to be ingrained in everything we do as everything goes digital, right? And I have a different perspective on things because. I actually just moved to San Francisco six months ago, so I came back for this conference just to come back to Cleveland because I, I grew up here for 25 years and then I decided to move. And I have a different view of security now that I've moved there because if you don't know, and you should know, but San Francisco is and Silicon Valley are the biggest tech hubs. Like It's the biggest tech hub in the United States, followed by New York City. And security there is thought of way differently than it is here. Like People look at it here and we talk about it at conferences and we go visit classes and we go visit uh, DerbyCon and we go visit DEF CON and from this local area I noticed people look at it and they think you know security is this and they have a mindset on it but I've realized that um, in, in Silicon Valley where everything is based around tech security is a much bigger deal people understand it much more fully and they see it in a different light than we do because everyone is technical like any person you run into knows how to use their computer that's weird I, I know a lot of people in, in, the, in the area, including my parents, don't know how to use their computer. But everyone, doesn't matter what the age group, where they work, they know how to use a computer. They understand the implications of security. Some of the companies need some security help. Um, it's also a big startup community, and startups don't look at security as being all that important. They look at it as a tacked on thing at the end. So I think there's a lot of room for expansion in security in San Francisco and in the Silicon Valley area still too. But um, for the most part, it's looked at differently. Not to mention that here, I had to go out of my way to find security individuals. I had to come to this conference. I had to go to DEF CON, and I would run into people and realize they live 45 minutes away, an hour away. And I had to seek out security people, like-minded individuals. In San Francisco, I can go sit down in a coffee shop and yell, penetration testing, and everyone's going, oh, OK. Like, this, everybody there knows what it is. And you can kick a rock, and you'll hit two millionaires and five security people, just because of the way that the industry is out there. And it's very, it's very cool, because people share the same sort of views that I do and that we do. So it's, it's a real neat place. And I just thought I would give a little bit of explanation because I got there and I looked around and I said, wow, these people just act differently when it comes to technology and security. And it's really, really neat. I love it there, personally. So it was a good move for me. But. Um, and this was a, uh, a quote that I was on a forum that I was talking to. And Silicon Valley is like high school. That's all the smart kids and everyone is. And that's kind of how it feels. Like, not to mention when it says kids, they mean it. Like I, the other day, I went down to San Jose and just was hanging out, and uh, I saw somebody in a Maserati, a Ferrari, and an Audi R8, and I believe all of them were probably no older than me, 25. So I was just like, wow, all the smart kids influence. And that's kind of my closing. Um, that's my Twitter, that's my corporate email, and then that's my Gmail if anyone wants to get a hold of me. And um, I am on Twitter kind of regularly, but not too regularly. So if you really want to get a hold of me, send it to my personal email at the bottom. I'll answer any questions. And also, any questions now? I'm not sure how much time I have. Three minutes? OK. Any quick questions? If not, you can catch me outside walking around. But anybody have anything they want to say? Question? Tell me I'm stupid. Thank you. <laughs> four years. Just over four years I was a benefit investor. Before that, I was a network administrator. Um, yeah, the, the firm I work with main, mainly deals with uh, Fortune 100, so I see some really cool pen stuff. Really cool pen stuff. And companies, it's almost scary sometimes. You see this big company that everyone uses for everything they do, and uh, you know, my team hacks into their stuff and we steal all their data. It's kind of scary.
Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. What's that? Oh, um, because we have the best pen testers in the uh, industry. Well, actually, on that same note, just the, we had a company which um, I can't say the name, but it's a large um, online stock company, which you guys could probably guess. But they've had pen tests for 10 years straight from various companies, and all they've gotten was SQL injection, which was nothing. It was sanitized in a development environment, no big deal. And then a couple cross-site scripting. Um, we owned their entire network. We had a route on every single box. And they'd had done it for 10 years straight from the company. So when I say we have the best in the industry, I mean, everyone says that. But I work with some really, really people that are way smarter than me. So, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.